And Pope Francis continued to make headlines this week, delving deeper into his vision for the upcoming 2023 Worldwide Synod of Bishops. While a Canadian diocese will require vaccinations for everyone attending Mass. Here to discuss all of this is the professor of theology at the Catholic University of America, Chad Pecknold. Chad, thanks for being with us. Before we start some breaking news, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi lashed out at comments made by Archbishop of San Francisco, Salvatore Cordelioni, who said that Catholics who support the effort to codify Roe v. Wade are in fact supporting what he calls child sacrifice. Here's Pelosi. Yeah, I'm Catholic. I come from a pro-life family, not active in that regard, uh, different in their view of a woman's right to choose than I am. In my right to choose, I had five children in six years and one week. And I keep saying to people who say things like that, when you have five children in six days, six years and one day, we can talk about what business is of any of us to tell anyone else to do. For us, it was a complete and total blessing, which we enjoy every day of our lives. But it's none of our business how other people choose the size and timing of their families. My, um, the, my, the Archbishop of the city, uh, that area of San Francisco, and I have a disagreement about who should decide this. I believe that uh, God has given us a free will to honor our responsibilities. Chad, your reaction to those comments, I mean, is this just up to others? There is no operative, objective morality at play here, even well, for Catholics? I mean, it's clear that Pelosi is not a Catholic in good standing. She doesn't believe that abortion is is murder. She she clearly thinks it's like, you know, just choosing a form of birth control that you just dispense with a human being uh, is is like any other choice that a human being makes, which is absurd. You'd never say, hey, what I, I think murder is bad, but, um, you know, whatever you want to do is fine. You have free will. That's absurd. Uh, so I think it's, you know, yeah. not surprising that Pelosi takes this position. She's not only is she not in communion with the church on on such questions, but she's not even in communion with reality, that we're actually talking about a human being in the womb, that dis dismissing and dispensing with a human being because you're taking and honoring responsibilities as a mother, it's just an absurd logic. Yeah, well, clearly she's on a collision course here with Archbishop Cordelioni. We'll see For what sure. happens next. I'm sure he'll respond. Uh, Chad, this past Saturday, Pope Francis addressed representatives from the Diocese of Rome to speak about that upcoming church-wide synod. Now, he emphasized the two-year-long synodal process that will involve a, quote, dynamism of mutual listening conducted at all levels of the church involving the whole people of God. Then he added... It is not about gathering opinions, no. It is to listen to the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit wants for the church to discover that God is always the God of surprises. Now, Chad, what do you think he means by asking that we be open to discover the God of surprises? Well, I mean, it's very romantic. It's, it's, it's sort of a romantic idea that, that um, really how the church thinks and moves and has its particular style of living and having a mission is, is that it discerns uh, the spirit through popular opinion. The church doesn't discern the spirit through the opinion of the faithful. The church discerns its life and mission through reflection on scripture, on revealed truths. Um, I'm sort of dismayed that a synod on synodality or class on classes or a seminar on seminars doesn't actually take substance uh, to be its, you know, something of substance. You know, he talks about synodality as denoting a particular style. Um, mm -hmm. The faithful don't need a particular style. They need truth. They need substance. And so I'm very worried about the way in which synodality actually just becomes a political technique um, for, you know, using, mm -hmm. using popular opinion in order to allow liberal elites to say they're listening to the spirit. Yeah, well, this is, the Pope keeps saying, and he says it adamantly, we are not gathering opinions, but this synodal process is really about uh, taking surveys, gathering opinions from even non-believers. Um, yeah. So, I, I, you know, it is, it is a, a 
a kind of an odd process here, because on the one hand, he's saying we're not gathering opinions, but we're for two years on the local level gathering opinions, aren't we? It's extraordinary. All these listening persons. You have the listening person in the local church, and how how will the listening person collect and curate all of those opinions, and how will those curated mm -hmm. opinions be passed up to the national conference, and how will the listening yeah. committee at the national conference curate those answers as they're passed to Rome, as they produce the instrumentum laboris? Uh, it's this long process of not just collecting opinions, but curating them. And I think this is the, mm. the problem that, that is implicit in the whole question of, of discernment. And discernment's right at the heart of the preparatory documents. And it's clear that Pope Francis means discernment in the kind of Ignatian spirituality right. sense of discernment, right? right? Where in, for St. Ignatius, it's about discerning the spirits, discerning where the Holy Spirit is leading you, which includes convicting you of sin um, and leading you into truth. Conversion, right. basically, is what St. Ignatius means. But the mm -hmm. question, I think, for the Synod on Synodality, and especially for the bishops who have an apostolic authority here to conduct the Synod, is does, synod, does Synodality mean what St. Ignatius means by it? Conversion, basically? Or does it mean something like a political technique for something mm. like Germany's synodal way, which is radical reform? Right. Right. We're watching a synodal process that has run into some problems. In fact, even Cardinal Walter Casper yeah. has come out and said, I don't even, do, do we even see a semblance of Catholicism here? Yeah. Um, but the Pope went on to say, Chad, that during the synodal process, quote, it may be necessary to leave, to change direction, to overcome beliefs that hold back and prevent us from moving and walking together. Now, this is not the first time Pope Francis has said that changes may be necessary and that we need to overcome beliefs that hold back. What beliefs might he be referencing here? What changes? Well, I mean, and I'm just reflecting on when you've lost Cardinal Casper, things aren't going well. I, I mean, I think that I don't know what he has in mind. I don't know what changes he has in mind. I know the changes are fear are the changes that, that minority groups are already organizing right now to influence the shape of the Synod. And they're largely trying to influence the shape of the Synod in exactly the way um, that we are seeing in Germany, in which the, the aim is social progressivism, to get the church to take on a new style, a particular style. That particular style is the style of the world we live in, in, in which you know, you have an acceptance of civil unions between people of the same sex. You have, you have a, a sort of liberalizing of many of the church's social teachings. And that is what we cannot have. That's not, that's not a synod of substance. That's a synod which is going to die. It's a synod that's not going to stand the test of time. I think about this democratic spirit that, con that conciliarism embodies and that maybe synodality embodies. And I think of, I keep thinking about Chesterton's quote about the democracy of the dead. Will this stand up to the democracy of the dead? I don't, I hope, I hope that it, we go in the St. Ignatius of Loyola way of discernment for conversion and not the, no. and not the kind of German way. During his 40-minute speech, uh, the Pope recalled that the Acts of the Apostles in the Acts, the Holy Spirit teaches Peter that, quote, God has no favorites and one cannot discriminate in the name of God. We cannot understand Catholicity without referring to the large field hospital which has no borders, end quote. This is a longtime theme of Pope Francis, Chad, but your reaction to its invocation here in the terms of this synodality and this synod on the synod? Well, I mean, it's interesting, even in the preparatory documents, you already mentioned that it's desiring a, a greater inclusivity, which includes including the opinions of people who aren't Catholic. Now, when you're yeah. trying to collect the opinions of people who aren't Catholic, they're not going to give you Catholic opinions. And so it seems like this synod of synodality risks being so open that it's actually closed to the mind of the church. And I think that's, that's, my, that's my great fear here and my great hope is that we'll have bishops 
who don't want to manage a process, but who want to be shepherds who are protecting their flock from wolves. The, the, the Pope noted uh, again, and he's spoken about this often, the rigidity in the church mm -hmm. uh, and in the church today. And he says there can be a rigid way of considering things that can mortify the patience of God. Rigidity is a sin against the patience of God. Your thought there, I mean, I guess that would include Ignatius and Chesterton and all the people you've been invoking all day long here, Chad. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know what Holy Father means by rigidity. I mean, I think, I think once again, it comes down to style rather than substance. Um, and that worries me. When, when a certain style is named as a sin, uh, mm. then I don't know what that means. If rigidity means something like the sub, uh, it, I don't know what it means. What does it mean? What's the substance of the claim about rigidity? I don't know what it would mean to call that a yeah. sin. Yeah, no, th this is, and, and look, I've spoken to a number of, of theologians, of, of churchmen, uh, of people who've spent their lives in ministry in the church. The imprecision of some of the language here, we're not quite sure what it refers to. How or would who you it refers confess to. that in the confessional? How would you, con I, Father, I've, I've been rigid three times. What, how, would you, how would you even <laughs> confess that? Well, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm, you know, as somebody who's done, as somebody who's done as much as I've done, rigidity is not the problem. It's, you know, but to, probably too much flexibility, That's doing right. too many things at once. Uh, there was a moment in this barely covered address, and again, Chad, we are often the only media outlet that takes these addresses seriously enough, right. or has the time to actually delve into them to report them. When, uh, but when they point to what's coming in this synod. That seems worthy of our eyes, I think. And the Pope referenced a rigid model of the church. Perhaps this will give us clarity. He says, there is much resistance to overcome the image of a church rigidly divided between leaders and subordinates, between those who teach and those who have to learn, forgetting that God likes to overturn positions. Now, what do you make of that, Chad? I mean, well, the bishops and the priests are supposed to be the teachers and the shepherds here. But what is he trying to, to help us understand? Look, I, here, my fundamental worry is that we had John Paul II and Benedict XVI secure a kind of settlement for how to receive Vatican II. And the desire mm. throughout the last you know, decade or so has, has been to unsettle that settlement. And the trouble is, is I never know what the, what the end goal is because all we're, all we're ever asked to do is to be open to unsettlement. Um, for what? For what end? And it's that uncertainty, that ambiguity, the confusion that arises from being asked to move in, a, in an unknown direction and to unsettle uh, settled truths that makes, I think, everyone a bit anxious about what the aim and end goal of a synod on synodality really is. Hmm. I, I want to move to something else. There was a transcript of a private meeting Pope Francis had with Jesuits in Slovakia mm -hmm. on September 12th. It was published on Tuesday. And during a Q&A session, a Jesuit pointed out that some people want the certainties of the past in their faith. Mm -hmm. And he asked, what vision of the church can we follow? And Pope Francis responded this way. I'll put it on the screen. Mm -hmm. You said something very important, which identifies the suffering of the church at this moment, the temptation to go backward. We are suffering this today in the church, the ideology of going backward. It is an ideology that colonizes minds. I think of the work that was done at the Synod on the family to make it understood that couples in second unions are not already condemned to hell. It frightens us to accompany people with sexual diversity. This is the evil of this moment, namely to seek the path in rigidity and clericalism, which are two perversions. Okay, Chad, uh, in, is the church suffering from this ideology of looking backward today? Is that what ails the church? I mean, in my experience, that that's not what young people are searching for, say, when they, when they want a more reverent um, liturgy. Mm -hmm. When they want a more reverent liturgy, they're actually they're actually uh, reacting against this kind of libertinism, this kind of fluffy '70s, know nothing, therapeutic kind of liturgy. They're not trying to go back 
to the past, they're actually rejecting the most recent past. And so whenever I hear that, I think, well, actually the rigidity here, if, if, there's a, if we can identify rigidity, is this desire to preserve the 70s and 80s. <laughs> that's that's mm. the real rigidity here. And That's um, an interesting point. Because, you know, the Pope, the Pope mentioned, following on the, the quote I just read, he mentioned stopping what he called the automatism of the ancient rite by limiting celebrations of the traditional Latin mass. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I thought as I read that, isn't that in some ways going back almost half a century before yeah. Benedict and John Paul, yeah. who legitimized and allowed greater celebration of the old rite? Yeah, I, I think there's a kind of nostalgia for the 70s here. Um, and um, I, I think this, I think bishops should really pay attention to this. You know, maybe rigidity is the right category for, for you know, being, for discerning the spirits and that the dis discernment of spirits should actually entail a little bit of self-criticism uh, by those who actually want to, to rehash the 70s. Wow. During this chat with Jesuits, the Pope also called what he labeled gender ideology. And then he added, this has nothing to do with the homosexual issue, though. If there is a homosexual couple, mm -hmm. we can do pastoral work with them, move them forward in our encounter with Christ. Chad, your reaction? Uh, I have no idea what to say other than James Martin must be very happy. Um, uh, I, think, I think we have... I think we have to reach out. I, we have organizations like Courage that that help mm -hmm. helps people uh, reach out. But once again, the question is, what is accompaniment? Is accompaniment and discernment like it, what it means for Saint Ignatius of Loyola, which entails conviction of mm -hmm. sin and being led into truth and being converted to holiness, which would completely, uh, you know, negate any notion of of homosexual action or union um, or does it mean holding hands with sin and and I think if it means holding hands with sin that's not real discernment of the spirits that's kind of following the spirit of the age uh, Chad before I let you go you heard our headline about the Vatican announcing on October 1st all visitors and personnel entering the Vatican City State will have to show a vaccine passport, mm -hmm. proof of vaccination or recovery from COVID within the previous six months. Uh, your reaction to this and what kind of precedent do you think it sets? We're already seeing similar things in the Archdiocese of Moncton mm -hmm. in, uh, in Canada, where they're requiring vaccine passports to go to mass. Well, again, it's, I mean, it's standard procedure in Europe and the Vatican's, in a sense, f following standard procedures in Europe. Uh, the good thing about it is that they, they are including natural immunity, recovery from COVID, right. positive tests. So I, I, I think, in, in a sense, it's less bad. The worry is less access to St. Peter's and, and more, I think, the Canadian, uh, the diocesan problem is more severe, I think, because there you're actually asking for proof of vaccination to receive the sacraments. And there I just think, you know, mm. did, you know, Jesus, Jesus said, I'll, I'll only heal the vaccinated? No, the lepers come, <laughs> you know. And, and I, think, I think this yeah. is a huge problem for, for any, any ecclesiology that takes, um, takes the kind of access to the sacraments seriously as, as something which is a divine yeah. gift. Um, I mean, we've had priests in the past go to leper colonies. You know, we, the church right. goes to leper. We, 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 have, we have a tradition of being like Jesus and actually putting ourselves in harm's way in order that people have access to the sacraments. So that a diocese would, would choose conformity to safetyism um, and restrict access to the sacraments to only the vaccinated seems to me a betrayal of the gospel. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and, you know, we have seen heroic efforts over the last couple of years of clerics, of, of bishops going out of their way to make, make those sacraments available to yep. people during this pandemic. You know, having outdoor masses on corners in the right. streets, bringing the sacrament to people in interesting and, and innovative ways. That's what the church should be doing, exactly. not barring people from coming to the sacraments. Uh, on September 26th, very quickly, the Swiss people will vote in a referendum on whether or not there should be, quote, marriage for all. Now, Open State Bishop Joseph Maria 
Bonamain, uh, the Bishop of Chur, has repeatedly entered into the debate claiming that he has no objection to same-sex unions. In a recent article, the bishop wrote, it is for me self-evident that other forms of partnership can be oriented toward an enduring love as well. My only concern is, and here I'm neither judging nor dismissing, I plead for maintaining this difference when naming these different marriages. What do you make of that statement? The corruption of the best is the worst, Raymond. Uh, I mean, it's, I, it's a sad statement to me because what it, what it presumes is there's a kind of rear guard um, acceptance of the, the spirit of our age, uh, which is absolutely harming human hearts and souls to be led into sin. And the, that kind of, you know, rear guard acquiescence to civil unions, I, I think, is absolutely contrary to what the church teaches about marriage. And as, as soon as you allow that to be an unresisted claim, a, a claim which is actually teaching the people something, um, you, you've sort of sacrificed your own wisdom, the wisdom that's been given to you by Christ himself. And, and I think that this is another sort of betrayal that we should be, that we should also repent of. Mm. Professor Chad Pecknold, I thank you for being here. We'll check in with you later. Great. Thanks again. Thank you.